Lives of the Most Eminent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects by Giorgio Vasari Life of Leonardo da Vinci Two accurate literal translations of the same original must often coincide, and in dealing with this beautiful life the translator has had to take the risk either of seeming to copy the almost perfect rendering of Mr. H. P. Horn or of introducing unsatisfactory variants for mere variety's sake. Having rejected the latter course, he feels doubly bound to record once more his deep obligation to Mr. Horn's example. End. End note. Painter and Sculptor of Florence The greatest gifts are often seen in the course of nature, reigned by celestial influences on human creatures, and sometimes in supernatural fashion, Beauty, grace, and talent are united beyond measure in one single person, in a manner that to whatever such an one turns his attention, his every action is so divine that surpassing all other men, it makes itself clearly known as a thing bestowed by God, as it is, and not acquired by human art. This was seen by all mankind in Leonardo da Vinci, in whom Besides a beauty of body, never sufficiently extolled, there was an infinite grace in all his actions, and so great was his genius, and such its growth, that to whatever difficulties he turned his mind, he solved them with ease. In him was great bodily strength joined to dexterity, with a spirit and courage ever royal and magnanimous, and the fame of his name so increased that not only in his lifetime was he held in esteem, but his reputation became even greater among posterity after his death. Truly marvelous and celestial was Leonardo, the son of Ser Piero da Vinci, and in learning and in the rudiments of letters he would have made great proficience, if he had not been so variable and unstable. For he set himself to learn many things, and then, after having begun them, abandoned them. Thus, in arithmetic, during the few months that he studied it, he made so much progress that by continually suggesting doubts and difficulties to the master who was teaching him, he would very often bewilder him. He gave some little attention to music and quickly resolved to learn to play the lyre, as one who had by nature a spirit most lofty and full of refinement, wherefore he sang divinely to that instrument improvising upon it. Nevertheless, although he occupied himself with such a variety of things, he never ceased drawing and working in relief, pursuits which suited his fancy more than any other. Ser Piero, having observed this, and having considered the loftiness of his intellect, one day took some of his drawings and carried them to Andrea del Verrocchio, who was much his friend and besought him straightly to tell him whether Leonardo, by devoting himself to drawing, would make any proficience. Andrea was astonished to see the extraordinary beginnings of Leonardo, and urged Ser Piero that he should make him study it. Wherefore, he arranged with Leonardo that he should enter the workshop of Andrea, which Leonardo did with the greatest willingness in the world. And he practiced not one branch of art only, but all those in which drawing played a part, and having an intellect so divine and marvelous that he was also an excellent geometrician, he not only worked in sculpture, making in his youth in clay some heads of women that are smiling, of which plaster casts are still taken, and likewise some heads of boys which appeared to have issued from the hand of a master. But in architecture also he made many drawings, both of ground plans and of other designs of buildings and he was the first, although but a youth, who suggested the plan of reducing the river Arno to a navigable canal from Pisa to Florence. He made designs of flour mills, fulling mills, and engines, which might be driven by the force of water. And since he wished that his profession should be painting, he studied much in drawing after nature, and sometimes in making models of figures in clay, over which he would lay soft pieces of cloth dipped in clay, and then set himself patiently to draw them on a certain kind of very fine rince cloth, or prepared linen, and he executed them in black and white, 
with the point of his brush, so that it was a marvel, as some of them by his hand, which I have in our book of drawings, still bear witness. Besides which, he drew on paper with such diligence and so well, that there is no one who has ever equaled him in perfection of finish. And I have won a head drawn with the style in chiaroscuro, which is divine. And there was infused in that brain such grace from God, and a power of expression in such sublime accord with the intellect and memory that served it. And he knew so well how to express his conceptions by draftsmanship, that he vanquished with his discourse and confuted with his reasoning every valiant wit. And he was continually making models and designs to show men how to remove mountains with ease, and how to bore them in order to pass from one level to another. And by means of levers, windlasses, and screws, he showed the way to raise and draw great weights, together with methods for emptying harbors, and pumps for removing water from low places, things which his brain never ceased from devising, and of these ideas and labors many drawings may be seen, scattered abroad among our craftsmen, and I myself have seen not a few. He even went so far as to waste his time in drawing knots of cords, made according to an order, that from one end all the rest might follow till the other, so as to fill around, and one of these is to be seen in stamp, most difficult and beautiful, and in the middle of it are these words, Leonardus Winky Academia. And among these models and designs there was one by which he often demonstrated to many ingenious citizens, who were then governing Florence, how he proposed to raise the temple of San Giovanni in Florence, and place steps under it, without damaging the building. And with such strong reasons did he urge this, that it appeared possible, although each man after he had departed would recognize for himself the impossibility of so vast an undertaking. He was so pleasing in conversation that he attracted to himself the hearts of men, and although he possessed, one might say, nothing, and worked little, he always kept servants and horses, in which latter he took much delight, and particularly in all other animals, which he managed with the greatest love and patience, and this he showed when often passing by the places where birds were sold, for taking them with his own hand out of their cages, and having paid to those who sold them the price that was asked, he let them fly away into the air, restoring to them their lost liberty. For which reason nature was pleased so to favor him that, wherever he turned his thought, brain, and mind, he displayed such divine power in his works that in giving them their perfection no one was ever his peer in readiness vivacity, excellence, beauty, and grace. It is clear that Leonardo, through his comprehension of art, began many things and never finished one of them, since it seemed to him that the hand was not able to attain to the perfection of art in carrying out the things which he imagined, for the reason that he conceived in idea difficulties so subtle and so marvelous that they could never be expressed by the hands, be they ever so excellent. And so many were his caprices, that philosophizing of natural things, he set himself to seek out the properties of herbs, going on even to observe the motions of the heavens, the path of the moon, and the courses of the sun. He was placed then, as has been said in his boyhood, at the instance of Ser Piero, to learn art from Andrea del Verrocchio, who was making a panel picture of St. John baptizing Christ, when Leonardo painted an angel who was holding some garments, and although he was but a lad, Leonardo executed it in such a manner that his angel was much better than the figures of Andrea, which was the reason that Andrea would never again touch color in disdain that a child should know more than he. He was commissioned to make a cartoon for a door hanging that was to be executed in Flanders, woven in gold and silk, to be sent to the king of Portugal, of Adam and Eve sinning in the earthly paradise, wherein Leonardo drew with the brush in chiaroscuro 
with the lights in lead white, a meadow with infinite kinds of herbage, with some animals, of which in truth it may be said, that for diligence and truth to nature, divine wit could not make it so perfect. In it is the fig tree, together with the foreshortening of the leaves and the varying aspects of the branches, wrought with such lovingness that the brain reels at the mere thought how a man could have such patience. There is also a palm tree, which has the radiating crown of the palm, executed with such great and marvelous art, that nothing save the patience and intellect of Leonardo could avail to do it. This work was carried no farther, wherefore the cartoon is now at Florence, in the blessed house of the magnificent Ottaviano de' Medici, presented to him not long ago by the uncle of Leonardo. It is said that Ser Piero da Vinci, being at his villa, was besought as a favor by a peasant of his, who had made a buckler with his own hands out of a fig tree that he had cut down on the farm, to have it painted for him in Florence, which he did very willingly, since the countryman was so skillful at catching birds and fishing, and Ser Piero made much use of him in these pursuits. Thereupon, having had it taken to Florence, without saying a word to Leonardo as to whose it was, he asked him to paint something upon it. Leonardo, having one day taken this buckler in his hands, and seeing it twisted, badly made, and clumsy, straightened it by the fire, and having given it to a turner, from the rude and clumsy thing that it was, caused it to be made smooth and even, and afterwards, having given it a coat of gesso, and having prepared it in his own way, he began to think what he could paint upon it that might be able to terrify all who should come upon it, producing the same effect as once did the head of Medusa. For this purpose, then Leonardo carried to a room of his own, into which no one entered save himself alone, lizards, great and small, crickets, serpents, butterflies, grasshoppers, bats, and other strange kinds of such-like animals, out of the number of which, variously put together, he formed a great ugly creature, most horrible and terrifying, which emitted a poisonous breath and turned the air to flame, and he made it coming out of a dark and jagged rock, belching forth venom from its open throat, fire from its eyes, and smoke from its nostrils, in so strange a fashion that it appeared altogether a monstrous and horrible thing. And so long did he labor over making it, that the stench of the dead animals in that room was past bearing. But Leonardo did not notice it. So great was the love that he bore towards art. The work being finished, although it was no longer asked for either by the countryman or by his father, Leonardo told the latter that he might send for the buckler at his convenience, since for his part it was finished. Ser Piero, having therefore gone one morning to the room for the buckler, and having knocked at the door, Leonardo opened to him, telling him to wait a little, and having gone back in the room, he adjusted the buckler in a good light on the easel, and put to the window, in order, to make a soft light, and then he bade him come in to see it. Ser Piero, at the first glance, taken by surprise, gave a sudden start, not thinking that that was the buckler, nor merely painted the form that he saw upon it, and falling back a step, Leonardo checked him, saying, This work serves the end for which it was made. Take it, then, and carry it away, since this is the effect that it was meant to produce. This thing appeared to Ser Piero nothing short of a miracle, and he praised very greatly the ingenious idea of Leonardo, and then, having privately bought from a peddler another buckler, painted with a heart transfixed by an arrow, he presented it to the countryman, who remained obliged to him for it as long as he lived. Afterwards, Ser Piero sold the buckler of Leonardo secretly to some merchants in Florence, for a hundred ducats, and in a short time it came into the hands of the Duke of Milan, having been sold to him by the said merchants for three hundred ducats. Leonardo then made a picture of Our Lady, a most excellent work, which was in the possession of Pope Clement the Seventh, and among other things painted therein, he counterfeited a glass vase full of water containing some flowers, 
in which, besides its marvelous naturalness, he had imitated the dewdrops on the flowers, so that it seemed more real than the reality. For Antonio Segni, who was very much his friend, he made on a sheet of paper a Neptune, executed with such careful draftsmanship, that it seemed absolutely alive. In it, one saw the ocean troubled, and Neptune's car drawn by seahorses, with fantastic creatures, marine monsters, and winds, and some very beautiful heads of sea gods. This drawing was presented by Fabio, the son of Antonio, to Messer Giovanni Gadi, with this epigram, Pinxit Vergilius Neptunum, Pinxit Homerus, Dum maris undisoni per vara flectet equos, mente quidem vatis illum conspexit uterque, winkius ast aculis, Eureque winket eos. The fancy came to him to paint a picture in oils of the head of a Medusa, with the head attired with a coil of snakes, the most strange and extravagant invention that could ever be imagined. But since it was a work that took time, it remained unfinished, as happened with almost all his things. It is among the rare works of art in the palace of Duke Cosimo, together with the head of an angel who is raising one arm in the air, which coming forward is foreshortened from the shoulder to the elbow, and with the other he raises the hand to the breast. It is an extraordinary thing how that genius, in his desire to give the highest relief to the works that he made, went so far with dark shadows in order to find the darkest possible grounds, that he sought for blacks which might make deeper shadows and be darker than other blacks, that by their means he might make his lights the brighter, and in the end this method turned out so dark that no light remaining there his pictures had rather the character of things made to represent an effect of night than the clear quality of daylight, which all came from seeking to give greater relief and to achieve the final perfection of art. He was so delighted when he saw certain bizarre heads of men, with the beard or hair growing naturally, that he would follow one that pleased him a whole day, and so treasured him up in idea that afterwards on arriving home he drew him as if he had had him in his presence. Of this sort there were many heads to be seen, both of women and of men, and I have several of them drawn by his hand, with a pen in our book of drawings, which I have mentioned so many times. Such was that of Amerigo Vespucci, which is a very beautiful head of an old man drawn with charcoal, and likewise that of Scaramuccia, captain of the gypsies, which afterwards came into the hands of Messer Donato Valdambrini of Arezzo, canon of San Lorenzo, left to him by Giambulari. He began a panel picture of the Adoration of the Magi, containing many beautiful things, particularly the heads, which was in the house of Amerigo Benci, opposite the Loggia de Peruzzi, and this also remained unfinished, like his other works. It came to pass that Giovan Galeazzo, Duke of Milan, being dead, and Lodovico Sforza, raised to the same rank, in the year 1494, Leonardo was summoned to Milan in great repute to the Duke, who took much delight in the sound of the lyre, to the end that he might play it, and Leonardo took with him that instrument which he had made with his own hands, in great part of silver, in the form of a horse's skull, a thing bizarre and new, in order that the harmony might be of greater volume and more sonorous in tone, with which he surpassed all the musicians who had come together there to play. Besides this, he was the best improviser in verse of his day. The Duke, hearing the marvelous discourse of Leonardo, became so enamored of his genius that it was something incredible, and he prevailed upon him by entreaties to paint an altar panel containing a nativity which was sent by the duke to the emperor. He also painted in Milan, for the friars of San Dominic, at Santa Maria della Grazie, a last supper, a most beautiful and marvelous thing, and to the heads of the apostles he gave such majesty and beauty that he left the head of Christ unfinished, not believing that he was able to give it that divine air which is essential to the image of Christ. 
this work, remaining thus all but finished, has ever been held by the Melanese in the greatest veneration, and also by strangers as well, for Leonardo imagined and succeeded in expressing that anxiety which had seized the apostles in wishing to know who should betray their master, for which reason in all their faces are seen love, fear, and wrath, or rather sorrow at not being able to understand the meaning of Christ, which thing excites no less marvel than the sight, in contrast to it, of obstinacy, hatred, and treachery in Judas, not to mention that every least part of the work displays an incredible diligence, seeing that even in the tablecloth the texture of the stuff is counterfeited in such a manner that linen itself could not seem more real. It is said that the prior of that place kept pressing Leonardo in a most importunate manner to finish the work, for it seemed strange to him to see Leonardo sometimes stand half a day at a time, lost in contemplation, and he would have liked him to go on like the laborers hoeing in his garden, without ever stopping his brush. And not content with this, he complained of it to the duke, and that so warmly that he was constrained to send for Leonardo, and delicately urged him to work, contriving nevertheless to show him that he was doing all this because of the importunity of the prior. Leonardo, knowing that the intellect of the prince was acute and discerning, was pleased to discourse at large with the duke on the subject, the thing which he had never done with the prior, and he reasoned much with him about art, and made him understand that men of lofty genius sometimes accomplish the most when they work the least, seeking out inventions with the mind, and forming those perfect ideas which the hands afterwards express and reproduce from the images already conceived in the brain. And he added that two heads were still wanting for him to paint, that of Christ, which he did not wish to seek on earth, and he could not think that it was possible to conceive in the imagination that beauty and heavenly grace which should be the mark of God incarnate. Next, there was wanting that of Judas, which was also troubling him, not thinking himself capable of imagining features that should represent the countenance of him who, after so many benefits received, had a mind so cruel as to resolve to betray his Lord, the Creator of the world. However, he would seek out a model for the latter, but if in the end he could not find a better, he should not want that of the important and tactless prior. This thing moved the Duke wondrously to laughter, and he said that Leonardo had a thousand reasons on his side. And so the poor prior in confusion confined himself to urging on the work in the garden and left Leonardo in peace, who finished only the head of Judas, which seems the very embodiment of treachery and inhumanity, but that of Christ, as has been said, remained unfinished. The nobility of this picture, both because of its design and from its having been wrought with an incomparable diligence, awoke a desire in the king of France to transport it into his kingdom, wherefore he tried by all possible means to discover whether there were architects who with cross stays of wood and iron might have been able to make it so secure that it might be transported safely without considering any expense that might have been involved thereby. So much did he desire it. But the fact of its being painted on the wall robbed his majesty of his desire, and the picture remained with the Melanese. In the same refectory, while he was working at the Last Supper on the end wall, where is a passion in the old manor, Leonardo portrayed the said Lodovico with Massimiliano, his eldest son, and on the other side the Duchess Beatrice with Francesco, their other son, both of whom afterwards became Dukes of Milan, and all are portrayed divinely well. While he was engaged on this work, he proposed to the Duke to make a horse in bronze of a marvelous greatness in order to place upon it as a memorial the image of the Duke, and on so vast a scale that he begin it and continue it that it could never be completed. 
and there are those who have been of the opinion, so various and so often malign out of envy are the judgments of men, that he began it with no intention of finishing it, because, being of so great a size, an incredible difficulty was encountered in seeking to cast it in one piece, and it might also be believed that from the result many may have formed such a judgment, since many of his works have remained unfinished. But in truth, one can believe that his vast and most excellent mind was hampered through being too full of desire, and that his wish ever to seek out excellence upon excellence and perfection upon perfection was the reason of it, tal che l'opera fosse ritardata dal deseo, as our Petrarca has said. And indeed, those who saw the great model that Leonardo made in clay vow that they have never seen a more beautiful thing or a more superb, and it was preserved until the French came to Milan with King Louis of France and broke it all to pieces. Lost, also, is a little model of it in wax, which was held to be perfect, together with a book on the anatomy of the horse, made by him by way of study. He then applied himself, but with greater care, to the anatomy of man, assisted by, and in turn assisting, in this research, Messer Marc Antonio della Torre, an excellent philosopher, who was then lecturing at Pavia, and who wrote of this matter, and he was one of the first, as I have heard tell, that began to illustrate the problems of medicine with the doctrine of Galen, and to throw true light on anatomy, which up to that time had been wrapped in the thick and gross darkness of ignorance. And in this he found marvelous aid in the brain, work, and hand of Leonardo, who made a book drawn in red chalk and annotated with pen of the bodies that he dissected with his own hand and drew with the greatest diligence, wherein he showed all the frame of the bones and then added to them in order all the nerves and covered them with muscles, the first attached to the bone, the second that hold the body firm and the third that move it, and beside them part by part he wrote in letters of an ill-shaped character, which he made with the left hand backwards, and whoever is not practiced in reading them cannot understand them, since they are not to be read save with a mirror. Of these papers on the anatomy of man, a great part is in the hands of Messer Francesco da Melzo, a gentleman of Milan, who, in the time of Leonardo, was a very beautiful boy and much beloved by him, and now is a no less beautiful and gentle old man, and he holds them dear and keeps such papers together as if they were relics, in company with the portrait of Leonardo of happy memory, and to all who read these writings it seems impossible that that divine spirit should have discoursed so well of art and of the muscles, nerves, and veins and with such diligence of everything, so also there are in the hands of, end note 11, the name is missing in the text, end, end note, a painter of Milan, certain writings of Leonardo, likewise in characters written with the left hand backwards which treat of painting, and of the methods of drawing and coloring. This man, not long ago, came to Florence to see me, wishing to print this work, and he took it to Rome, in order to put it into effect, but I do not know what may afterwards have become of it. And to return to the works of Leonardo, there came to Milan, in his time, the king of France, wherefore Leonardo, being asked to devise some bizarre thing, made a lion which walked several steps, and then opened its breast and showed it full of lilies. In Milan he took for his assistant the Milanese Salai, who was most comely in grace and beauty, having fine locks, curling in ringlets, in which Leonardo greatly delighted, and he taught him many things of art and certain works in Milan, which are said to be by Salai, were retouched by Leonardo. He returned to Florence, where he found that the Servite friars had entrusted to Filippino the painting of the panel for the high altar of the Nunziata, whereupon Leonardo said, that he would willingly have done such a work. Filippino, having heard this like the amiable fellow that he was, retired from the undertaking, and the friars, 
to the end that Leonardo might paint it, took him into their house, meeting the expenses both of himself and of all his household, and thus he kept them in expectation for a long time, but never began anything. In the end, he made a cartoon containing a Madonna and a St. Anne with a Christ, which not only caused all the craftsmen to marvel, but when it was finished, men and women, young and old, continued for two days to flock for a sight of it to the room where it was, as if to a solemn festival in order to gaze at the marvels of Leonardo, which caused all those people to be amazed, for in the face of that Madonna was seen whatever of the simple and the beautiful can by simplicity and beauty confer grace on a picture of the Mother of Christ, since he wished to show that modesty and that humility which are looked for in an image of the Virgin, supremely content with gladness at seeing the beauty of her son, whom she was holding with tenderness in her lap, while, with most chastened gaze, she was looking down at St. John as a little boy who was playing with a lamb, not without a smile from St. Anne, who, overflowing with joy, was beholding her earthly progeny become divine. Ideas truly worthy of the brain and genius of Leonardo. This cartoon, as will be told below, afterwards went to France. He made a portrait of Ginevra da Merigo Benci, a very beautiful work, and abandoned the work for the friars who restored it to Filippino, but he also failed to finish it, having been overtaken by death. Leonardo undertook to execute for Francesco del Giocondo the portrait of Mona Lisa, his wife, and after toiling over it for four years, he left it unfinished, and the work is now in the collection of King Francis of France at Fontainebleau. In this head, whoever wished to see how closely art could imitate nature was able to comprehend it with ease, for in it were counterfeited all the minutenesses that with subtlety are able to be painted, seeing that the eyes had that luster and watery sheen which are always seen in life, and around them were all those rosy and pearly tints, as well as the lashes, which cannot be represented without the greatest subtlety. The eyebrows, through his having shown the manner in which the hairs spring from the flesh, here more close, and here more scanty, and curve according to the pores of the skin, could not be more natural. The nose, with its beautiful nostrils, rosy and tender, appeared to be alive. The mouth, with its opening, and with its ends united by the red of the lips to the flesh tints of the face, seemed in truth to be not colors but flesh. In the pit of the throat, if one gazed upon it intently, could be seen the beating of the pulse. And indeed, it may be said that it was painted in such a manner as to make every valiant craftsman, be he who he may, tremble and lose heart. He made use also of this device. Mona Lisa being very beautiful, he always employed while he was painting her portrait persons to play or sing and jesters who might make her remain merry in order to take away that melancholy which painters are often wont to give to the portraits that they paint. And in this work of Leonardo's there was a smile so pleasing that it was a thing more divine than human to behold and it was held to be something marvelous, since the reality was not more alive. By reason, then, of the excellence of the works of this most divine craftsman, his fame had so increased that all persons who took delight in art, nay, the whole city of Florence, desired that he should leave them some memorial, and it was being proposed everywhere that he should be commissioned to execute some great and notable work, whereby the commonwealth might be honored and adorned by the great genius, grace, and judgment that were seen in the works of Leonardo. And it was decided between the gonfalonier and the chief citizens, the great council chamber having been newly built, the architecture of which had been contrived with the judgment and counsel of Giuliano da San Gallo, Simone Polaiuolo, called Il Cronaca, Michelangelo Buonarotti, and Baccio Daniolo, as will be related with more detail in the proper places, 
and having been finished in great haste, it was ordained by public decree that Leonardo should be given some beautiful work to paint, and so the said hall was allotted to him by Piero Soderini, then Gonfalonier of Justice. Whereupon Leonardo, determining to execute this work, began a cartoon in the Sala del Papa, an apartment in Santa Maria Novella, representing the story of Niccolo Piccinino, captain of Duke Filippo of Milan, wherein he designed a group of horsemen who were fighting for a standard, a work that was held to be very excellent and of great mastery by reason of the marvelous ideas that he had in composing that battle, seeing that in it rage, fury, and revenge are perceived as much in the men as in the horses, among which two with the four legs interlocked are fighting no less fiercely with their teeth than those who are riding them do in fighting for that standard which has been grasped by a soldier who seeks by the strength of his shoulders as he spurs his horse to flight, having turned his body backwards and seized the staff of the standard to wrest it by force from the hands of four others, of whom two are defending it, each with one hand, and, raising their swords in the other, are trying to sever the staff, while an old soldier in a red cap, crying out, grips the staff with one hand, and raising a scimitar with the other, furiously aims a blow in order to cut off both the hands of those who, gnashing their teeth in the struggle, are striving in attitudes of the utmost fierceness to defend their banner, besides which, on the ground, between the legs of the horses, there are two figures in foreshortening that are fighting together, and the one on the ground has over him a soldier who has raised his arm as high as possible, that thus with greater force he may plunge a dagger into his throat, in order to end his life, while the other, struggling with his legs and arms, is doing what he can to escape death. It is not possible to describe the invention that Leonardo showed in the garments of the soldiers, all varied by him in different ways, and likewise in the helmet crests and other ornaments, not to mention the incredible mastery that he displayed in the forms and lineaments of the horses, which Leonardo, with their fiery spirit, muscles, and shapely beauty, drew better than any other master. It is said that in order to draw that cartoon, he made a most ingenious stage, which was raised by contracting it and lowered by expanding, and conceiving the wish to color on the wall in oils, he made a composition of so gross an admixture to act as a binder on the wall that, going on to paint in the said hall, it began to peel off in such a manner that in a short time he abandoned it, seeing it spoiling. Leonardo had very great spirit and in his every action was most generous. It is said that going to the bank for the allowance that he used to draw every month from Piero Soderini, the cashier wanted to give him certain paper packets of pence, but he would not take them, saying in answer, I'm no penny painter. Having been blamed for cheating Piero Sodanini, there began to be murmurings against him, wherefore Leonardo so wrought upon his friends that he got the money together and took it to Piero to repay him, but he would not accept it. He went to Rome with Duke Giuliano de' Medici at the election of Pope Leo, who spent much of his time on philosophical studies, and particularly on alchemy, where, forming a paste of a certain kind of wax as he walked, he shaped animals very thin and full of wind, and by blowing into them made them fly through the air. But when the wind ceased, they fell to the ground. On the back of a most bizarre lizard, found by the vine dresser of the Belvedere, he fixed, with a mixture of quicksilver, wings composed of scales stripped from other lizards, which, as it walked, quivered with the motion, and having given it eyes, horns, and beard, taming it and keeping it in a box, he made all his friends, to whom he showed it, fly for fear. He used often to have the guts of a weather completely freed of their fat and cleaned, and thus made so fine that they could have been held in the palm of the hand, and having placed a pair of blacksmith's bellows in another room, he fixed to them one end of these, 
and blowing into them filled the room, which was very large, so that whoever was in it was obliged to retreat into a corner, showing how, transparent and full of wind, from taking up little space at the beginning, they had come to occupy much and likening them to virtue. He made an infinite number of such follies, and gave his attention to mirrors, and he tried the strangest methods in seeking out oils for painting and varnish for preserving works when painted. He made it this time for Messer Baldassare Turini da Pescia, who was datary to Pope Leo, a little picture of the Madonna with the child in her arms, with infinite diligence and art. But whether through the fault of whoever primed the panel with gesso, or because of his innumerable and capricious mixtures of grounds and colors, it is now much spoiled. And in another small picture, he made a portrait of a little boy, which is beautiful and graceful to a marvel. And both of them are now at Pescia in the hands of Messer Giuliano Turini. It is related that a work having been allotted to him by the Pope, he straightway began to distill oils and herbs in order to make the varnish, at which Pope Leo said, Alas, this man will never do anything, for he begins by thinking of the end of the work before the beginning. There was very great disdain between Michelangelo Buonarotti and him, on account of which Michelangelo departed from Florence, with the excuse of Duke Giuliano having been summoned by the Pope to the competition for the façade of San Lorenzo. Leonardo, understanding this, departed and went into France, where the king, having had works by his hand, bore him great affection, and he desired that he should color the cartoon of St. Anne, but Leonardo, according to his custom, put him off for a long time with words. Finally, having grown old, he remained ill many months, and feeling himself near to death, asked to have himself diligently informed of the teaching of the Catholic faith and of the good way and holy Christian religion, and then, with many moans, he confessed and was penitent, and although he could not raise himself well on his feet, supporting himself on the arms of his friends and servants, he was pleased to take devoutly the most holy sacrament out of his bed. The king, who was wont often and lovingly to visit him, then came into the room, wherefore he, out of reverence, having raised himself to sit upon the bed, giving him an account of his sickness and the circumstances of it, showed withal how much he had offended God and mankind in not having worked at his art as he should have done. Thereupon he was seized by a paroxysm, the messenger of death, for which reason the king, having risen and having taken his head in order to assist him and show him favor to the end that he might alleviate his pain, his spirit, which was divine, knowing that it could not have any greater honor, expired in the arms of the king in the seventy-fifth year of his age. The loss of Leonardo grieved beyond measure all those who had known him, since there was never any one who did so much honor to painting. With the splendor of his aspect, which was very beautiful, he made serene every broken spirit, and with his words he turned to yea or nay every obdurate intention. By his physical force he could restrain any outburst of rage, and with his right hand he twisted the iron ring of a doorbell or a horseshoe as if it were lead. With his liberality he would assemble together and support his every friend, poor or rich, if only he had intellect and worth. He adorned and honored in every action, no matter what mean and bare dwelling, wherefore in truth Florence received a very great gift in the birth of Leonardo, and an incalculable loss in his death. In the art of painting he added to the manner of coloring in oils a certain obscurity whereby the moderns have given great force and relief to their figures. And in statuary he proved his worth in the three figures of bronze that are over the door of San Giovanni, on the side toward the north, executed by Giovan Francesco Rutici, but contrived with the advice of Leonardo, which are the most beautiful pieces of casting, the best designed, and the most perfect, that have as yet been seen in modern days. By Leonardo we have the anatomy of the horse, and that of man, even more complete. 
and so, on account of all his qualities, so many and so divine, although he worked much more by words than by deeds, his name and fame can never be extinguished. Wherefore, it was thus said in his praise by Messer Giovan Battista Strozzi, Vince costui pur solo tutti altri, e vince fidia e vince apelle, e tutto il lor vittorioso stuolo. A disciple of Leonardo was Giovan Antonio Botrafo of Milan, a person of great skill and understanding, who in the year 1500 painted with much diligence for the Church of the Misericordia without Bologna, a panel in oils containing Our Lady with the Child in her arms, St. John the Baptist, St. Sebastian naked, and the patron who caused it to be executed, portrayed from the life on his knees, a truly beautiful work, on which he wrote his name, calling himself a disciple of Leonardo. He has made other works, both at Milan and elsewhere, but it must be enough here to have named this, which is the best. Another of his disciples was Marco Ogioni, who painted in Santa Maria della Pace the passing of Our Lady and the marriage of Cana in Galilee.